so in the previous uh, lecture, we, we discussed the benign epithelial neoplasm. So in this lecture, we're going to discuss the malignant epithelial neoplasm. So cancer, as you know, is a general terminology to uh, address any kind of malignancy, anything. We call it as a cancer. So oral cancer means oral malignancy. Uh, we'll discuss the etiology of oral cancer and also some amount of molecular uh, pathology as well. Um, and uh, oral cancer can be any, any of uh, uh, the malignant epithelial neoplasms. All of them are referred to as oral cancer, but the most common one is squamous cell carcinoma. So we'll be discussing that in a lot detail, followed by varicose carcinoma and uh, malignant melanoma. So all these are like uh, very clear distinctions between uh, whatever we studied so far, the benign counterparts, as well as the uh, dysplasia, how it spreads is what we are going to see. Uh, again, there are a list of uh, malignant epithelial neoplasms. Um, you can go through them at your leisure, but uh, these three are what I'm going to teach you. Squamous cell carcinoma, varicose carcinoma, and malignant melanoma, because I feel these are uh, important, uh, whereas the others you can uh, look up and you can understand them if you're interested. So what is uh, cancer? Um, why is it called a uh, cancer? Cancer is, like I said, commonly used uh, terminology for any malignant uh, lesion. In Latin, it means crab. So you know the sea uh, animal. Uh, we even consume it as seafood, crabs, which are quite delicious, quite tasty. So the crab has like a fat body and then you, it has uh, legs which are extending right so uh, why cancer is called so or it is compared to a crab is because there will be a tumor primary tumor and it invades all the surrounding structures in this manner and not only that it can uh, invade or metastasize to distant organs as well but local invasion uh, resembles uh, the structure of or the anatomy of a crab and that's why it's called as cancer okay so oral cancer is cause uh, it's the top 10 major cause of uh, mortality mortality means death okay so clinically whenever as like uh, layman people say death but as clinicians we have to use the term mortality and morbidity morbidity is for the disease mortality is for the death so this is a top 10 major cause of mortality in the world and uh, majority of oral carcinomas are squamous cell carcinoma that's why i said we are going to study that in a lot detail compared to the other two so squamous cell carcinoma is defined as a malignant epithelial neoplasm which exhibits squamous differentiation by, as characterized by the formation of keratin and or, or the presence of intercellular bridges. So based upon the ability of forming the keratin and the presence of intercellular bridges, it is histopathologically classified as well. So remember the definition. So what is squamous cell carcinoma? You remember the dysplasia which we studied in uh, leukoplakia or the pre-malignant lesion? all the dysplastic features. So this is the end stage of the series of alteration in the squamous epithelium, meaning the dysplasia when it progresses, what happens is that it breaches the basement membrane and it invades the underlying connective tissue. So that's when it is called as a squamous cell carcinoma. So what happens is these dysplastic uh, cells, when they're limited within the epithelium, you call it as uh, uh, mild, moderate, severe dysplasia or intra-epithelial carcinoma. But when it breaches the basement membrane and goes into the connective tissue, it's called as frank malignancy. Uh, Another reason why it is very important when it comes to squamous cell carcinoma is the overall survival rate is just 50%, half and a half. So overall survival rate, usually you give it for five years, okay? So the five-year survival rate in oral cancer is 50%. So you cannot really assure uh, the patient for a longevity. 
So let's see what are the causative factors which are associated with the oral squamous cell carcinoma. So you know tobacco is one of the major causative factors. So tobacco is consumed in two different uh, manner. One is smoked tobacco and the other is smokeless tobacco. So smoked tobacco is a cigarette. This is BD. This is a cigar and this is a pipe. So these are some of the common uh, ways of smoking tobacco. And of course, in the Middle East, we have uh, uh, medwakh or doha and uh, uh, shisha, which is the most common forms of smoking tobacco in the Middle East area. Uh, this is in the rest of the world. We also have smokeless tobacco. So there is something called a snuff, which they kind of inhale through the nose. Uh, that is one form of tobacco. There is chewing uh, tobacco, where they chew the tobacco leaves, either with some flavoring agents or just the tobacco. Uh, even that is supposed to intoxicate them. So these two are uh, uh, the different forms of consumption of uh, tobacco. Actinic radiation, I think it's a very well-known uh, cause of uh, uh, carcinoma and uh, skin cancer especially. And when it comes to head and neck or the oral cavity, it's the lip cancer, which is caused by the uh, UV radiation. And uh, infection, I already told you, human papilloma virus type 16 and 18 causes the oropharyngeal uh, carcinoma. Epstein-Barr virus causes Kaposi's sarcoma. And HIV is associated with a lot of different uh, carcinomas as well. Even candida has been implicated, which I'm going to discuss today, only the candida one. And any chronic irritation, the chronic irritation can be in the form of a sharp tooth. That's why you should always go to the dentist whenever there's a sharp tooth repeatedly injuring your either buccal mucosa or, uh, you know, alveolus or whatever. Uh, you have to go and get it smoothened because any chronic irritation, whether it's a sharp tooth, a fractured restoration or uh, uh, denture, a sharp edge of a denture, repeatedly causing chronic irritation can result in cancer after many, many years, but it can. And alcohol consumption, I think even in the last class, I told you it acts as a synergistic factor with the, excuse me, tobacco. What alcohol does is, uh, the tobacco is here. So uh, what do you, normally people do is when they drink, they smoke, uh, uh, even if they're not smokers, but whenever they're drinking, they like to smoke. So that's, that's a common uh, culture. So what alcohol does is that it uh, uh, increases the permeability of the oral mucosa. Normally, oral mucosa is not permeable to a lot of toxins. It can defend itself. Uh, against the toxins safe from the smoke. But whenever you're drinking, the permeability increases. So all the toxins from the, the nicotine can easily enter uh, your oral mucosa and cause the genetic abnormalities. So what's considered as a hallmark of cancer, there are six hits which has to happen for the cancer to occur. So this is again a cell cycle. I've already described it to you during wound healing. So I'm not going to again describe it. Uh, you know that there are several phases. So this is the synthesis phase. This is the gap two phase, mitosis phase, gap one space. So there are some checkpoints between uh, these uh, which make sure that the cell is all right to carry on proliferating, okay? What happens in cancer is what we're going to look at. The normal cells, I mean, some of the normal cells, because there are some cells which do not divide, there are some cells which proliferate. So the ones which proliferate all their life grow and divide, but there are several controls. It's not like it has. it is an uncontrolled division or uncontrolled proliferation. They only divide when the growth factors stimulate them, they send them a signal and tell them divide. Only then they divide, okay, number one. So if that is damaged, then uh, that is if the cell is damaged, then a molecular break will uh, occur, meaning it puts a stop, it tells them to stop dividing until the cell becomes repaired. 
that's that's the the checkpoints are uh, uh, acting for this purpose. Whenever they see the cell is damaged, this is what they do. If they cannot be repaired, then they commit a suicide. Okay, they uh, undergo uh, cell death, and that is called as apoptosis. And they can only divide a certain number of times. After that, the cell goes out of the cell cycle. It dies. Okay, it, It's not like it can continue dividing all its life. After a certain number of division, it dies. And they are, they're a part of a tissue structure. Say, for example, it's an epithelial cell. It stays in the epithelium. It's a connective tissue cell. It stays in the connective tissue. They don't proliferate and then go to other areas. Like epithelium cell does not proliferate and go into the connective tissue. That's abnormal. And they need a blood supply to grow because blood is what supplies the nutrition. So, so that's that's the uh, normal, like whatever is happening in the normal. So in cancer, what happens is all these mechanisms will be damaged. All these mechanisms has to be overcome for a cell to become a cancerous cell. And all these mechanisms are controlled by several uh, proteins, which we'll discuss in the next slide. And whenever there is a malfunction of these proteins, then all these mechanisms are disrupted or becomes carcinomatous. Uh, so these proteins will become either non-functional or they malfunction. Okay, either that means either they stop functioning or they function wrongly. Uh, whenever the DNA sequence of the genes is damaged. So how are these DNA sequences damaged and how they, how do they acquire the mutation? That is coming from all the factors which we discussed, your cigarette, your alcohol, uh, radiation, uh, the virus, the infections, uh, the smoked and the smokeless tobacco. Okay, So all these features together are what is inducing mutation in these cells to undergo uh, a change into something else. They're no more normal. They're, they've become abnormal. They've become mutated. And that's when they become cancerous. Uh, there is normal cell cycle, which I described in the last class. So whenever there is any abnormality and it, the cell undergoes mutation, the, because of there is a malfunction of the uh, critical proteins involved in these mechanisms, it becomes cancerous. So some terminologies for you to remember uh, when it comes to uh, the six hits, uh, which leads to cancer. Uh, what the cancer cell acquires is a self-sufficiency in growth signal. I told you growth factors are responsible to give a signal to the cell to multiply or divide, right? So self-sufficiency means the cancer cell develops its own ability to give signal to itself to continue to multiply, OK? So you can compare it to the accelerator pedal stuck on in your vehicle, uh, in your car, or whatever. And uh, there are something called as anti-growth signals. So whenever it sees that the cell is dividing unnecessary or uh, there is hyperplasia, hypertrophy, or whatever, then it sends an anti-growth signal and tells the signal, please stop dividing. Okay. What cancer cell does is it develops an insensitivity to anti-growth signal. Anti-growth signal keeps on telling the cell, stop dividing, stop dividing, stop dividing, but the cell does not respond to it. So it becomes insensitive. So that can be compared to the brakes not working in your vehicle. So it's a cell death or cell suicide. Whenever it is abnormal, uh, it, under, it has a program inside which tells it to kill itself. So evading apoptosis. So even if the cell is abnormal, it doesn't die. It doesn't undergo suicide. Okay, So it won't die when the body normally would kill the defective cell. Like it undergoes either cell death or there is a program cell death. Limitless replicative potential. So in the normal cycle, I told you that a cell can replicate only for a certain time, and then it dies. But a cancerous cell can go on replicating endlessly for however long. Uh, that will create infinite generations of descendants as well, because whenever a bad cell is replicating, what is happening? What happens when a cell is already mutated and it is replicating? What is it generating? More bad cells, yeah? More mutated cells are being formed. So that will increase the cancerous potential of the cell or the tissue. And uh, what is angiogenesis? So angiogenesis 
is the formation of the new blood vessels actually so sustained angiogenesis meaning uh, this cancerous cell forms its own blood supply because it is growing big and big and big and uh, it is forming a lot of bad cells and they need nutrition so it 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 uh, tells the blood vessels to form more and more and more new blood vessels which are like intertwined throughout the malignant tumor so that it can live okay so it is telling the body to give it blood supply which is essential for nutrition and the last is the tissue invasion and metastasis. So it develops the ability to migrate and spread to other organs and tissue. So I told you the innate character of a cell is to remain in the tissue where it belongs. Epithelium cell, epithelial cell remains in epithelium. Connective tissue cells remain within the connective tissue. But in case of a mutated cell, it can go anywhere in the body, anywhere from epithelium to connective tissue and from blood to distant organ. And these are the six hits which converts a normal cell into an abnormal cell. So those were the six hits, uh, which is essential. Um, so it, this is just a summary. Uh, and uh, what are the molecular proteins which are involved is what I'm going to say. So in summary, you can say that the normal regulation of the cell division and apoptosis are altered in cancer, to put it in very simple way. Uh, and neovascularization occurs, that is the new blood vessel formation to provide the nutrition. So that's like a summary. So what are the proteins which are affected? Let's see. So there's something called as oncogenes. So the normal genes are uh, called as uh, proto-oncogenes. And whenever these proto-oncogenes are transformed, they're termed as activated oncogenes. So this transformation is because of virus, radiation, chemical agents, smoking, whatever we discuss. So all these are the causative uh, factors. Uh, so what are these oncogenes? It's a specific locus of gene which is responsible for forming the protein that can upset, upset the replication of cell cycle um, and result in continuous mitosis or continuous proliferation of the cell. So that's an oncogene. And what are tumor suppressor genes? So whenever uh, uh, the cell is uh, rapidly proliferating, the cell cycle is arrested. This is in the normal condition, and that happens by tumor suppressor genes. But in cancer, the tumor suppressor gene also undergoes mutation. So this allows the tumor production indirectly and uh, this is because of abnormalities in all these uh, genes that is p53 p21 and prb rb is for retinoblastoma so all these are involved either in the cell cycle or apoptosis or any of them okay so these are what are mutated uh, and that results in cancer and like I said, the human papilloma virus 16 and 18 are responsible for the causation of oropharyngeal carcinoma. Okay. So clinically, how does it look? It is a disease of the older people because it is a chronic disease and there has to be accumulation of all these mutations over several years. So they say it's a 10 rule. 10 cigarettes in a day for 10 years is what is supposed to uh, accumulate enough mutation to cause uh, cancer, okay? So uh, that's what they said. So if you're a smoker, please quit smoking or at least reduce the number of the cigarette and gradually quit smoking. Uh, so that's why it's a, a, a disease of older age. But of course, you can see it in younger people because a lot of uh, kids, especially unmonitored kids and in uh, very poor underdeveloped countries in a lot of countries where refugees are there so all these uh, children are getting into bad habits in a very early age so they have started to smoke and drink and uh, abuse uh, themselves from a very young age so you can see cancer in such patients at quite a younger age because they have accumulated enough mutations for carcinomatous change and the sites which are commonly affected are lips, followed by lateral border of tongue and the floor of the mouth. And it is also, if you remember when I was discussing dysplasia, I told you lateral border of tongue and floor of the mouth are at a higher risk of malignant transformation. So those are the common sites of squamous cell carcinoma, if you translate that and correlate it. 
And uh, earlier, uh, the men to women ratio was lesser. It was three is to one, but now it is increased three is to two. Number one, because women are also indulging themselves in drinking and smoking. And that's one of the cause of a higher incidence of cancer in women. Number two is uh, uh, because of the uh, awareness and uh, because of uh, the advances in the medical treatment, uh, the, the, the incidence of cancer in men is uh, reducing. So both of these factors together has led to an increase in the male to female female ratio from threes to one to uh, threes to two now and it is increasing. So clinically it has varied appearance so I want uh, to show you each and every single uh, way it can occur it is not limited so here if you see it it appears so inconspicuous I think uh, you have infections coming up uh, uh, after this uh, series of non-odontogenic tumors uh, in that we'll be studying candidal infection so this appears like a simple candidal infection or maybe aspirin burn or some like you know when you eat pizza very hot pizza when the cheese touches your palate or some soft tissue it causes this kind of burns so it has very inconspicuous appearance but sadly when uh, they took a biopsy it it was it found to be a squamous cell carcinoma uh, after uh, the biopsy was taken so it can have a very 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 uh, innocent appearance or inconspicuous appearance and it can occur as a classical uh, ulcer with a rolled out border excuse me if you see the border here it is rolled out and in the center it is showing necrosis and this is usually a late presentation uh, which basically translates to a quite uh, advanced stage of uh, cancer you can also, uh, it can also appear as an indurated crusted ulcer with keratosis. This can, you know, look like some uh, trauma or uh, some kind of uh, uh, ulcer or normal ulcer, which is undergoing crusting and healing. But uh, if it is present for a very long time, then you have to doubt that it is cancer. And here you can see there is extensive ulceration, necrosis, and distortion even of uh, the face of the patient. But uh, these kind of features are very rare these days because the patients have become aware, especially if they have a, a history of habit or any uh, uh, genetic history, like their parents have had it, their grandparents have had it, or siblings have had it. So uh, they go to the doctor immediately whenever they see a doubtful lesion. So this kind of disfigurement is quite rare, and uh, this is quite an old picture. That's why it's in black and white. In the older days, it used to have that kind of an appearance. But remember, see, whenever it is on the face or on the rest of the body, the patient can easily look at it. It is visible. Even for others, others can tell, hey, what's that? What's that on your uh, face? Uh, and uh, I've noticed that it's been there on your face for a while. It is, could be your best friend. It could be your family member, anybody who knows you well. Uh, but when it is inside the oral cavity, you're the only person who can look at it. So the diagnosis is further delayed because of this reason. So these are the ex exophytic and endophytic appearances. Uh, we've already discussed what it means. And uh, it can have the leukoplakic appearance and the speckled appearance. All those were different clinical appearance of uh, uh, the squamous cell carcinoma. So histopathologically, uh, it is classified based upon the degree of differentiation exhibited by the tumor cells and how closely it resembles the tissue of origin, that is your stratified squamous epithelium. So based on that, it is classified as well differentiated, moderately differentiated, and poorly differentiated. So let's let's see what is the uh, meaning of uh, each of that. So this is well differentiated squamous cell carcinoma. So when we say well differentiated, it means that the squamous uh, epithelium still has the ability to differentiate and uh, it still resembles the normal stratified squamous epithelium. How can we see it histopathologically? 
because we can see significant amount of keratin. If you see here, there is keratin formation. And there is also some form of maturation from the basal cells, uh, which we can see. So these two features indicate that it is still retaining the normal structure and function of squamous epithelium. So structure is by the basal cell differentiation function is by formation of keratin. So these two things indicate that it is still retaining uh, the structure and function of the tissue of origin. But of course, you see dysplasia all over, all over the epithelium. It has uh, retipeg extensions, the bulbous retipeg extension. And you see these are the islands of the cancerous cells and even this keratin, which has invaded the connective tissue. OK, so this is the epithelium. But you see the islands of uh, cancerous epithelial cells invading the connective tissue. So that's the moderately, sorry, well differentiated squamous cell carcinoma. Remember this because it has clinical significance and the treatment. Uh, and tumors, some tumors produce either little keratin or no keratin at all. If you see here, I don't see any keratin at all in this entire tissue. But you can still recognize it as stratified squamous epithelium. It still has layers or strata. It still has uh, intercellular junctions. It still has retained some amount of uh, uh, the squamous cell architecture. OK, so all these uh, features are still uh, retained. So that is called as moderately differentiated squamous cell carcinoma. But of course, the invasion it has become more, you can see. And there is a loss of uh, cohesiveness that is in this area, especially you see that uh, the cell junctions are lost. So there is no differentiation even between the epithelium and the connective tissue. The cancerous cells have become uh, one with the connective tissue. There is no basement membrane seen distinguishing epithelium and connective tissue. So that's called as the moderately differentiated squamous cell carcinoma. And then we are going to the poorly differentiated uh, uh, squamous cell carcinoma. So here, the epithelium has completely lost both the structure and function, which means it will not produce any keratin. It has very, very little resemblance uh, to the origin of uh, tissue, that is the stratified squamous epithelium. So there is a lack of normal architecture. There is uh, lack of or loss of cohesiveness, that is the intercellular junctions are all lost. So the cells are lying freely, if you see, they're like lying freely everywhere. There's extensive dysplastic, uh, dysplastic features. So you can see that uh, there is abnormal mitosis, there is mitosis, hyperchromasia, increased nuclear cellular cytoplasm. You can clearly see there is a loss of cell junction. They're not attached to each other. So all these are uh, features of poorly differentiated squamous cell carcinoma. So now to answer me, which one of these will have a poor prognosis? Which one you think is more aggressive, more dangerous, and can cause death for the patient? Because it still has certain resemblance to the stratified squamous epithelium, it is still not very bad because it is still having some features and function. Okay, But in poorly differentiated uh, uh, squamous cell carcinoma, there is absolutely no resemblance when it comes to structure or function. So that means that it has lost its true nature completely. Completely it has transformed into something else. So this is more dangerous and this is what is uh, having poor prognosis. So remember, poorly differentiated, poor prognosis. Okay, remember it like that, okay? So this is just a, a, a revision for you guys. Tell me what type of uh, grading this is. You can read this. See the image and tell me which grade it is. And you can see keratin formation. You can still see uh, the structure of the epithelium, although there are dysplastic features all over. OK, OK, next image.
that was a quick uh, revision of the grading of oral squamous cell carcinoma. So clinically, that was histopathological grading. Clinically, there is something called as TNM staging. T stands for the size of the primary tumor. N stands for the nodal metastasis, that is the lymph node, how far it is spread to the lymph node. And distant metastasis is M. Okay, M stands for distant. There are many variations now. I, I mean, it's unbelievable how many amount of staging we have. There is TNMS, there is TNMSP, there is TNMP, many, many stages, okay? But uh, let's not go into all that. This is the basic clinical staging, and this is what I want you to remember, and that's what a surgeon uses to decide uh, the treatment, and that is why you should know. You like during uh, i don't know if you go ahead and decide to be an oral and maxillofacial surgeon so during your clinical uh, postings you might have to know this like like by heart like you should you should be able to say it at any time of the day if you're asked you should be that well versed uh, but for now i'm just going to tell you in a simple way you understand it but uh, it's all right if you do not like uh, wrote, learn it or something. Okay, just try to understand whatever I'm trying to say. So the T is stands for primary tumor. Uh, T0, when there is no evidence of primary tumor, you don't see any tumor. TIS is carcinoma in situ. I told you it's no longer a terminology used. It is now called as intraepithelial carcinoma. T1 is when the tumor size is two centimeter or less. When it's uh, two to four centimeter, it's two. Uh, T2 greater than 4 centimeter is T3 and when a tumor is uh, invading the adjacent structure it's T4. Lymph nodes I hope you all know uh, different lymph nodes there is uh, submental there is submaxillary there is submandibular uh, there is uh, uh, the chain of uh, lymph nodes in your uh, cervical lymph nodes and uh, many lymph nodes are there okay, around your head and neck area. So you have to palpate all of them. Whenever a lymph node is fixed and it doesn't have any pain, then it is malignant. If it has pain and if it is movable, then it is inflammation. This information I want you to remember very, very, very well because this is something you will be doing when you're in the clinic, even for a normal dental patient who comes with some sort of infection. So if it is just a normal infection, it will be painful when you palpate it and it will be movable. Suppose if it is fixed to the underlying structure, enlarge, and if it is doesn't have any pain when you palpate it, that means it is malignancy. Okay. So N1 will be suspicious, palpable, and ipsilateral, meaning on one side, and N2 is contralateral. It will be on uh, both the sides. And uh, N3 will be palpable, large, fixed uh, node. M0, if there is no metastasis. And M1, you will see both clinical as well as radiographic evidence of metastasis. So why I'm saying radiograph is most of the tumors from your oral cavity go to the lung. Okay. So when you take an x-ray, you can see that there is a uh, square, uh, there is a carcinoma of the lung. Even there it's called uh, squamous cell carcinoma, adenocarcinoma, several uh, carcinomas depending on which structure of lung is affected. So you will see that radiographically there is evidence of metastasis. Even to the bone it can go. Uh, but uh, lung and liver are most uh, common. So based on that, there are several stages. One, two, three, four. Stage four patient means it is poor prognosis. Okay, that's how the clinician decides the treatment. Uh, so in stage four, as you can see, uh, the two, T1, N2, M0, T2, N2, M0, any T or N along with the metastasis, that is M1 is considered as a stage, stage four. And even if the distant metastasis is not there, but still if uh, it has reached N3 and uh, T3, then it is considered as stage 4 and it has poor prognosis. Okay, So that's how you remember. 
metastasis, I told you, happens via the lymphatic vessels, which go to the regional lymph nodes. So the lymph vessels from the uh, oral cavity, the, it drains all the cancerous cells, and then they go and reach the lymph nodes. You, you have parotid, you have buccal, there is submandibular, there is submental, and your uh, cervical uh, lymph nodes. Uh, there are uh, uh, all these uh, lymph nodes help in the spread or the distant metastasis of the primary tumor to the rest of the uh, body. And this is a clinical image. You can see that it is large, fixed, and uh, painless. Uh, so this uh, tumor cells, when they reach the lymph nodes, because they kind of, you know, get themselves packed, it expands the uh, lymph node and it eventually penetrates even the capsule of the lymph node and will extend into the surrounding tissue of the lymph node as well, apart from spreading to dis uh, distant organs. Mm -hmm. And they're clinically de detectable, like I said, uh, they will be fixed and painless. And uh, the submandibular and sur deep cervical, so these submandibular and the deep cervical are some common uh, ones which are affected and you can easily palpate them. And like I said, lungs and liver are the most common organs which are uh, affected in the distant metastasis. Mm -hmm. So treatment, uh, you have surgical treatment, there is chemotherapy and there is radiation therapy. Sometimes a combination of all of them can be uh, done. So depending upon the size, site, stage, uh, the TNM staging, which I described, surgical treatment uh, will have to be decided. And whenever you're excising the tumor, you also have to ex excise the regional lymph nodes. There is a specific terminology uh, for that. It is called as RND. Uh, that's the regional lymph node dissection, R-N-D, okay? Regional lymph node dissection. So if it is, suppose it is well differentiated, for example, most of the uh, lower lip or the vermilion border uh, shows a well differentiated squamous cell carcinoma. And because it is in the lip, it is often diagnosed at an early stage because it is visible easily. And for this, only surgical excision is good enough. You don't have to do radiotherapy or chemotherapy or anything. But suppose it is poorly differentiated, especially in case of lateral border of the tongue or floor of the mouth. And these are usually diagnosed at the later stages and it would have already metastasized as well. So in this case, you have to use the combination of radiotherapy and chemotherapy along with the surgery. And like I said, these patients will have much poorer prognosis and less than six months of uh, survival rate. So that was about squamous cell carcinoma. So the, the same etiology applies to all other oral cancers as well. So let's start with the varicose carcinoma. It is called as a low-grade variant of oral squamous cell carcinoma. It is, it is a type of oral squamous cell carcinoma, but it is kind of a low-grade tumor. Uh, it is white and warty in appearance. Uh, so that's why I've put all the carcinomatous lesion depending on what I discussed in the benign lesion. So uh, your squamous papilloma was also white and warty. So here we are looking at the carcinomatous component that's white and warty, which is varicose carcinoma. And it is exophytic in uh, appearance, of course. Etiology, the main etiology which they have come up is the snuff, because the snuff, of course, is put in your nose, but there is a connection between the nose and the oral cavity. So you will see the tumor in the oral cavity. So you see that there is an extensive varicose lesion covering most of the buccal mucosa, and it is also involving the commissure, which is nothing but the angle of your mouth, okay? It's called as commissures, mouth commissures. There is an excessive keratin production, as you can see here. That's why it has a uh, white appearance. And uh, uh, over a long period of time, it can turn into squamous cell carcinoma and can result in distant metastasis. But otherwise, it is a low-grade squamous carcinoma, and it is quite limited and has a good prognosis. 
So epithelium is thickened. Uh, you can see the thickness of the epithelium has increased and there are uh, uh, there is a heavy keratinization which you see on the top. The retorages are broad shaped and it has a broad pushing front. Uh, that's the terminology which is uh, used. So the lower border is quite well defined if you see here. Okay, It is not really, uh, it doesn't have any loss of basement membrane and uh, you don't really see much invasion into the connective tissue. Again, another picture showing a lot of keratin plugs, which is imparting the white color for the lesion and broad pushing uh, front of the red ridges. And uh, the dysplasia is also not uh, uh, severe like we see in squamous cell carcinoma. So treatment um, depends upon the type uh, nature of the lesion because it is slow growing and it spreads laterally than to a deeper uh, uh, depth of the lesion. So the excision you have to do accordingly. So you have to make sure that the surrounding normal tissue is involved and you're doing a wider surgical excision rather than a deeper surgical excision. And it can be excised relatively easily unless it has grown to a very huge extent. And if it is left untreated for several years, like I said, it becomes squamous cell carcinoma with distant metastasis. The next uh, malignant tumor is malignant melanoma. So this is the malignant counterpart of your uh, nevus. So this has a very poor prognosis and it is asymptomatic very uh, it is seen only at a very late uh, stage I mean, by the time your diagnosis it's become it's spread everywhere uh, uv uh, exposure that is uh, ultraviolet exposure fair complexion and sun, sun sensitivity are all causative factors for this and older age group and men are commonly affected and intraorally it's the palate which is the most common site followed by the alveolus upper alveolus and uh, uh, when I was showing you the video previously that uh, video showed a radial growth phase or a pegetoid pattern uh, where you see large atypical melanocytes even in the superficial layers of the epithelial layer okay and uh, melanocytes will have abundant pale cytoplasm and they all cluster together they are they're all usually arranged in small round cluster and that's what we see in uh, the malignant uh, melanoma. And there is a focal micro invasion, which you can clearly see where the melanocytes, that's the atypical melanocytes, or you can say malignant melanocytes, mm -hmm. abnormal melanocytes, you can see are invading the connective tissue. Whereas in Nevis, they were very benign looking, normal uh, looking melanocytes. Uh, so, like I said, the term pegetoid is used to describe when the melanocytes are seen in superficial layers and it is termed as superficial spreading melanoma. Again, in melanoma also, there are so many different types. I don't want to confuse you. I want you to understand uh, the clinical appearance and the histopathology rather than the types because it's very minute differences. Uh, so the superficial spreading type, remember that it is it has a pegetoid appearance. And there is another type called nodular type of malignant melanoma. Here you will see a frank invasion of the connective tissue and uh, they're usually arranged in a pattern called as alveola pattern. So that's the only two types which you might want to remember. Superficial spreading type and the nodular type. And uh, nodular type has a poorer prognosis compared to the superficial spreading type. And um, uh, there are fine powdery melanin deposition by these melanocytes, which gives a dusty appearance to the cytoplasm. And uh, uh, what is very tricky is that mitotic figures, which are like a hallmark of cancer, abnormal mitosis, may not be conspicuous in uh, malignant melanoma. So it's very tricky to diagnose uh, this. But that's why you depend upon what is called as immunohistochemistry. So special stains are used where the tissue is stained. And when it comes as positive, it is an indication that it is 
malignant melanoma. So it will be positive for S100, HMB45, Melan A, and Vimentin. So whenever there's a case of malignant melanoma, you cannot just rely on histopathology. You have to do some advanced histotechnics as well. Uh, so this I've already showed you, superficial spreading melanoma. You can see melanocytes mm -hmm. even in the superficial areas of the epithelium. And melanin is usually contained within the melanophages. This is in uh, superficial spreading melanoma. Whereas in nodular melanoma, microscopically it shows variety of cells. And uh, uh, the most common is a large epitheloid cell with a clear pink cytoplasm. I cannot really show it to you here. But you can see the melanin deposits. Yeah, All these brownish deposits are melanin deposits. They're sporadically distributed and the cells show extensive pleomorphism so uh, that's the nodular melanoma clinically so radical surgery with the prophylactic neck dissection is the treatment of choice for malignant melanoma but it has poor prognosis like i said uh, 